Welcome to the Founders Foyer with me, Ashwarya. This foyer is full of conversations. The space where creators, founders, and builders look for all the support and concepts to grow their ideas into products. When was the last time you tried explaining an idea to your friend, co-worker, or co-founder? Of course, it happens quite frequently for most of us. But looking back at the experience, at certain instances, we spent more time trying to explain because the person could understand it better. And there are times when they immediately vibe with us. So what exactly is the purpose of communication, especially from the context of clarity, brevity, and impact? I have someone with me right here to break it all down for us. Matt Abrahams is a lecturer at Stanford Graduate School of Business, wherein he teaches entrepreneurial minds about organizational behavior, strategic communication, persuasion, and cognitive planning. He also runs the Think Fast, Talk Smart podcast, wherein he hosts guests and discusses everything around maximizing the effectiveness of communication. Matt also held senior leadership positions at software companies, where he created and ran global learning prior to teaching. Hey, Matt, thank you so much for being here on the show today. I am excited to be here with you and look forward to our conversation. Awesome. So let's just get started. Uh, you know, from software companies where you ran global leadership teams to publishing books, teaching and running a podcast, everything has been around communication, right? How did you enter this space and, you know, looking back, how do you connect all these journeys together? Uh, well, it was all by by trial and error and and, and just dumb luck. So uh, I I've always been somebody who who has enjoyed communicating all through my schooling. I had opportunities to communicate and I pursued those. When I went to college, university, I was very interested in becoming a doctor, a medical doctor. And I then met calculus and chemistry, and they they taught me that that perhaps might not be the best approach for me. And I began studying other things, and I was exposed to psychology and became very, very interested in it. And it turns out within psychology, what interested me was communication. So mm -hmm. I ended up graduating with degrees, both my undergraduate and graduate degrees, in, in fields I didn't know existed before I started studying. So uh, once I found my passion in communication, uh, I applied it in the corporate world. I ran, as you said, learning and development groups and saw just how critical communication is within an organization. You, you don't have to be the, the smartest, the best at your job, but if you can communicate well, you, you can have lots of opportunity. And conversely, you can be an expert in your particular field or your particular job. But in fact, if you can't communicate it well, it can lead to trouble. So I saw that and then had an opportunity to come back to my passion, which is teaching. And mm -hmm. ever since then, teaching communication skills, helping entrepreneurs, helping students to, to improve and hone their communication. And I love it. I love it. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely love the way you put it as a con connectivity between different points because um, uh, mostly people tend to look at, you know, communication or teaching at only certain lens, but you brought in the team context, which is very important. Often we don't understand the effectiveness of communication at workplace because we think that talking to teammates or getting something done is is just about conveying our ideas and, and it's only looked at from one side of the lens. But there's the other side where, you know, the, the uh, stakeholders around should understand what we're trying to convey. So I think you brought that important point and it shows how much of importance uh, communication has with, with this context. So I'm glad you're actually teaching a lot of uh, young minds about how to get this better, how to do this better, which is exactly what we would go ahead and discuss more on this show now. Great. Awesome. So now that you brought this context of students and entrepreneurs, uh, one thing that I um, always had in my mind was you talk to all of these people every day and there's so much potential where it's in an environment where these people can learn from each other and there's a lot of serendipitous opportunities for them. But what is that one surprising mistake or pattern that you notice in this uh, bunch of ambitious folks when you try to teach them or when you try to coach them? The fundamental and foundational mistake that most people make in their communication is they focus only on what they want to say. Mm -hmm. They don't think about what their audience needs to hear. And I don't care if that's one individual, if that's a small group meeting, or that's a big presentation. If we only focus on what we want to say, we miss an opportunity to connect, to make our content salient and relevant, and we might fail. 
So first and foremost, people have to think not about what do I want to say. They need to think about what does my audience need to hear, which mm -hmm. begs for them to think about who their audience is, what their experience and expertise is, and how they can make their content relevant for the audience that they're speaking to. Right. So it sounds more like a role play, right? Where you take the focus away from you, but then you try to put it on the person or the group of individuals who are listening to you and then try to try to pass over and, and like think more from the issues. Um, sounds more like that. Absolutely. It's about empathy. It's about putting yourself in the other person's shoes. The reality yeah. is all of us suffer from the curse of knowledge. We know way mm -hmm. too much about the things we're talking about. And our yeah. audience often doesn't have that same depth of knowledge or experience. So if we talk at the level that's comfortable for us, we might be talking over their heads or not hitting the mark for them. So really taking on their position, as you said, uh, thinking about it from their needs can make a mm. fundamental difference. Absolutely. You know, this reminds me of one of those um, uh, concepts that I was reading in the recent times. There are like two types of listening. One is to trying to understand uh, whether what we say is is getting really conveyed and trying to understand their viewpoint. The other kind of listening is just zoning everything out and, and just like running your own voice in your head. So a lot of communication is also like trying to listen to what the other party says and also trying to then regroup the things that you have in your mind and, and use that rational instead of just zoning them out and, and always trying to make your own point, right? That's a very astute observation. Listening is active. It is absolutely two-way. You're listening to the other person, but you also have to listen to yourself, mm -hmm. your opinions, your ideas, your reactions to what you hear. And that's the challenge because as you said, many people just focus on one or the other, or many people yeah. don't focus on either. They listen just enough to think they understand what the person says, and then they go right in and say what they want to say. Mm -hmm. Listening is an under-focused area of communication. And on, on the podcast I host, where we interview communication experts, listening keeps coming up over and over again as an essential, necessary step in effective communication. And you're right. right, we have to listen to what the others say, but also to what we ourselves are saying. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's very true. And I'm glad you brought up this um, um, concept about talking to other people as well, because this is uh, this is very different from different contexts, right? Like uh, when you're there in a school environment, the kind of uh, listening and the kind of talking you do is very different from when you're put in a corporate setup or when you're trying to uh, pitch to investors or working with different sets of people from the pet space. So um, this kind of a, an active listening and learning and talking is always going to have context switching in different uh, places. So I'm glad that you're trying to bring in experts from different um, streams to talk about this. Absolutely. The ability to switch context based on who you're speaking to is really important. Mm -hmm. That said, I believe there are just some foundational principles of effective communication, like you should be audience centric, that transcend mm -hmm. all context. Whenever we're speaking, we should be thinking about the needs of our audience as well as some other things. But you're absolutely right. The different contexts require different yeah. types of communication. Yeah, that's true. Also, now since we are talking about um, getting the other person to understand what we say and trying to uh, make them get a mental picture of what's there uh, within within ourselves, uh, you know, uh, we often think putting ideas out or explaining something is uh, is easy. But this is not always the case because uh, you have too much of focus on how not to be wrong. You know, whenever there's this idea, of, before we try to uh, spread out the roughness of it, we're always like, okay, wait, I think this person sh uh, should understand it. I think this person should approve it. So how do you suggest turning this kind of speaking anxiety to an excitement where you just, you're okay with uh, conveying whatever comes to your mind instead of always thinking about this should be right or, or this should be conveyed very well. A lot of us believe that there is a right way to say what we are saying or to write what we're writing. And that gets in the way of doing it well. And in some cases, uh, doing it at all in the terms of anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been doing this work for a long, long time. And I'm, I'm here to tell you and your listeners that there is no right way to communicate. There are better ways and worse ways, but there is no one right way. Right. And we put pressure on ourselves to do it right. 
And that means we're evaluating and judging and thinking about all the things that we can say. And in fact, doing so reduces the likelihood that we'll say things well. You know, there's a wonderful saying from the world of improvisation, and it goes like this. It says, dare to be dull. I've translated that to strive for mediocrity. And, you know, when I tell my Stanford MBAs this, they, they, their jaws drop. They're like, what do you mean? I've never been told just to, to get it done. But in fact, when you take the pressure off yourself to do it right and you quiet those judging and evaluative voices and you're just saying what you need to say, you actually can harness your full cognitive capacity to say what it is you need to say. So mm -hmm. daring to be dull, striving to be mediocre actually enables and empowers you to achieve greatness. It's the trying to be great that gets in the way of actually being effective at all. So a key element to managing anxiety is to change your focus from getting it right to just getting it done. And when you give yourself permission just to get the information out, you can then focus on how to get it out the best way possible. So it, ta it, it takes a lot of mental effort to, to make this switch. It is not as easy as I make it sound, but if you can, yeah. then in fact, you can be much more effective in your communication. Mm. Wow, that's that's a very contradictory, um, you know, approach like, you know, your Stanford student says, uh, anybody who listens to this at the first glance would be like, okay, wait, am I supposed to do the opposite thing to actually get it right? Because, you know, we always have this constant um, thought that we have to be right and we have to be great in terms of communication. And I think that's also because we have grown up that way. Like we always have people telling us, um, you know, you should deliver smart um, uh, thoughts. You should always uh, look at delivering something with the great speed, with, with uh, this kind of clarity, with this kind of um, uh, perfection that you have to let the other person understand. But this sounds so much contradictory to it. At the same time, uh, I think you're, uh, you're absolutely right in saying that when he removes that pressure off um, our minds, at least we would get uh, closer to making the other person understand. So, yeah, I think it's a good uh, uh, practice for all of us to start playing from now. You know, anybody who's ever learned a sport or learned a musical instrument is familiar with this concept. When you think mm -hmm. too much about it, it gets in the way of you actually doing it. And so yeah. we just have to remind ourselves that in other areas of our lives, we've learned this skill to turn down the volume of the internal critic, judge, and evaluator. And so we can do it. We just don't apply those same ideas to our communication. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I remember that this um, there's this book called The Inner Game of Tennis, right? And there's mm -hmm. a video also that came up with the book. And I remember that um the author was actually trying to coach people uh, how to play tennis and this was absolutely uh, somebody who did not know how to hold the racket did not know how to actually serve or um, just hit the ball that's coming forward but uh, this person was teaching uh, these group of people as approach it like you would dance just not think about it just try to keep serving just like look at the ball just try to keep swaying your hand like you would do in a dance and uh, people got all of these serves right at the end of it. So I think it's very similar to what you're just meaning in terms of um, trying to take it as a sport, trying to just like look at it as a, a game and not not really go all perfect on it and, and just don't go with all the anxiety on it. Absolutely. And that's a wonderful book. And the, the inner game of tennis and the inner game yeah. of golf are, are, he can teach you a lot about communication. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So let's dig a bit deeper into that mediocrity part that you were just mentioning. Um, I, I remember reading in one of your articles about um, minimum viable communication. And for the product person in me, I could like immediately relate it to the design concept of MVP, which is minimum viable product. So does believing in this make you actually say that um, MVC as a concept for communication journey would work? So tell us more about why you came up with this concept and a little more into that uh, good enough is great and the whole mediocrity part to follow. Sure. So uh, I'm not the one who originated this idea of applying minimally viable product design principles to communication, but I certainly champion it. So mm -hmm. this notion of minimally viable product design, as you well know, is all about rapid prototyping. It's about understanding your users and their requirements, creating wireframes, and then getting them out in front of your, your user community to get feedback. It's the iteration yeah. that's important. 
And we certainly embrace it at Stanford's Business School. Uh, many of the clients that I coach absolutely use this uh, approach to designing products and services. The same concepts, as we've already alluded to, apply in communication. You need to know your audience. Your audience are your users. You, you need to structure messages and test them, see if they work. And then you begin to, to craft and layer on more and more information that you can communicate. So very, very similar processes can be really helpful to people as they develop their communication. To get to the topic of good enough is great or, you know, dare to be dull or mediocrity is, is what you should strive for. Again, when you undergo minimally viable product design, the goal mm -hmm. isn't to create an amazing product right at first. The goal is to learn. The goal is to adapt. The goal is to get feedback so you, that you can adjust. And the mm -hmm. same is true in communication. If you, if you put the pressure on yourself to make your first iteration perfect, it never will achieve that because you'll be constantly doubting, judging, uh, rather than get something that that meets the minimal needs. That's why it's called minimally viable and then get it out. And the same is true with communication. And then you can iterate on it. So the concepts that we talked about earlier definitely apply to the concepts of minimally viable communication. Mm -hmm. So you mean to say that when this kind of a concept is embraced, even our day-to-day interactions could get you know, less stressful and, and more clear in terms of not just always looking at it for pitches and something more grand, but just interpersonal communication, just talking to our friends, just trying to get better at what we convey. You know, when you meet with your friends, your family, you, you want to connect, you want to be present, you want to enjoy what you're doing. And if you're constantly mm -hmm. judging, evaluating and thinking, is this the right way to say it? then you're not being present. You know, it's sort of like the person who goes on a vacation to a beautiful location and spends all their time taking pictures on their phone of the location <laughs> rather than actually taking time to look around and enjoying the location. So if we're constantly in our heads, evaluating and judging, then we're not experiencing and enjoying the, the immediacy of what we have. So we need to be present. We need to turn down the volume of the judge and evaluator. And I'm certainly not saying you should never think about what you're saying. You absolutely need to. And there is a time and a place to judge and evaluate what you're saying. The problem is most of us are maximizing that in every circumstance and missing right. opportunities uh, to, to really connect. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And I often see this uh, come up in, in most of... Um, these tech enthusiasts because uh, uh, often they have this thought that they want to go to these networking events. They actually want to connect with people. They want to make the best use of an opportunity. At the same time, it gets pretty exhausting when you just try to look at it more as uh, one way of communication where you know, when somebody asks you, hey, what do you do? And then you have this whole essay to talk about where you're like, oh, I work on this, I work on this, I work on this. And then it gets it gets too structured and and you kind of miss out on uh, uh, the active listening, which we spoke at the start of the start, and uh, uh, understanding how there could be a synergy between the uh, uh, conversations that come up from other people as well. Because you're too much in your head and you're just looking at always making this one-way communication to them, always trying to talk only about you. So uh, I, I kind of uh, vibe with what you just said now, where you need to know uh, in which context you have to give in all to talk about yourself. And at the same time, uh, try to take a step back and see what you can observe from the environment around and then take a, a judgment on communication based on that. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, a lot of us approach small talk, chit chat, these interpersonal uh, communications we find ourselves in uh, as data gathering opportunities. I just today on my podcast interviewed an expert on small talk and relationship building. And she said, most of us approach this as data gatherers. We go into these circumstances. What do you do? How do you do it? What's important to you? That's yeah. all gathering data. And her, her approach, she says, that's not fun. That puts a lot of pressure on you. Uh, rather, approach these with curiosity. Try to make yourself intriguing. Try to figure out what makes other people intriguing. So when you approach it from a place of curiosity, your questions aren't going to be, what do you do and what do you work on? Your questions are going to be, what excites you? What makes you interested in? What, what are your hobbies? And that changes the whole dynamic, but it requires you to have a different mindset, a different approach, and to listen differently. Because if I'm not just, if it's not just about collecting facts and details, then it's really about connecting and finding points where we have similarities. And that's the really interesting and important parts.
that's very true and i i absolutely love the term data gatherers because yeah uh, it's it's something that we are often prone to uh, especially when you work in tech it's always like okay what was the information i collected at the end of the day uh, i talked to this customer so what do i know from them i talked to this uh, 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 teammate and what kind of a data do i gather from this so it's like just trying to take a step back from that and take a very different approach and uh, curiosity is what could lead you to understand the synergy that we're talking about. So I think uh, it's fantastic that this is a tip uh, to, to step back and to look at it more from the curiosity lens and not from just like collecting facts. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think it's fascinating. I loved it when she said it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, since you're talking a lot around uh, how do you just stop this judgment and how do you like just approach uh, everything with curiosity, I also wanted to touch upon the concept of feedback. Because um, uh, as often being um, in, in the entrepreneurial space, we have this tendency to work on something, always try to get active feedback from people and um, try to fine tune something to, to shift. So often this feedback is not uh, very easy to digest, right? Because it could go against one's belief or it could also not be really uh, uh, suited for us. So in those instances, how do you think one should handle um, these emotions that come along and communicate their thoughts better with the feedback that they receive. So as a recipient of feedback, you, you really need to reframe the circumstance. So one, think of feedback as a gift. Feedback is, is a gift that somebody is giving you. We have to assume that the goal is to help improve how we work, how we see the world, et cetera. If you come into feedback as a recipient in a defensive way, in a way that, you know, I know my stuff and I know it right and who are you mm -hmm. to tell me, then you're missing an opportunity. You know, feedback is an opportunity to grow, to improve, to, to learn about yourself. The reality is we don't know ourselves as well as we think we do. You know, how we interact, how others see us is really, really important for us to, to get insight from and other people can give us insight and fill in the blind spots. So, I encourage everybody to not only see feedback as a gift, but to actively seek out feedback, especially when it comes to your communication. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get better. You know, the only way you get better at communication is three things. It's about reflection, repetition, and feedback, right? If you, if you don't get the reps in, do the practice. If you don't reflect on what worked and what didn't. And finally, if you don't get feedback from other people, there's no way you can improve. You know, we all fall victim, if we don't, if we don't look for that, we all fall victim to that definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. You have to take time to do repetition, reflection, and feedback to get better at any skill, especially communication. Right. And do you usually suggest that there's a certain way you filter feedback out? Uh, because you said reflection and uh, during reflection, let's say you realize that uh, not every feedback is right. Um, at, at times, this feedback may not be completely relevant to you uh, for what you're working on or for the current uh, uh, pace that you are in. So do you usually suggest that there's a certain filter or there's a certain lens that you want this person to always look through and filter feedback with? Well, so I, I think when it comes to accepting feedback or hearing feedback, you need to look for patterns, patterns over mm -hmm. time. Any one person's perception is simply that, one person's perception. But if you begin to see patterns, so if I ask two, three, four people for feedback and they all are coalescing around one or two things, then I should mm. probably pay attention to that. If just one person says something, maybe that's less valuable. Now, of course, it, it's, you know, who is that person? What's their experience? Yeah, it, it makes a difference. You know, if I'm learning a new sport, the person who's been doing that sport for a long time, their feedback might be better than my friends who are also learning with for me. But right. By and large, I think the way to, to think about feedback is to look for patterns and trends over time rather than mm -hmm. any one specific initial bit of feedback. Yeah, it's a great tip. Thanks, thanks, Matt. So look back and try to just document what's the feedback that's happened over the last couple of times and um, give more weight to uh, what you see as more reckoning. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. That's a good tip. Thanks. So, uh, now switching gears a bit to negotiation, which uh, I think is a lot around persuading, right? And I know you talk and you have a lot of tips around persuasion. So there's one particular 
uh, thought that I had around negotiation, which is often people view it as like a battle. You know, it's always like who wins, who walks away, who gets the best out of the deal. But also for me, negotiation was one way you stay invested in the game. Uh, it's it's more like an interesting two way game where uh, you try to process the input that the other person gives you, and then you try to see what's the better way you can alternate that and you can offer something. So what would be the best way to negotiate? And do you generally have a thought around negotiation, like a certain purview that you would always uh, tell people about? Uh, I definitely, I have an opinion on everything, but uh, the, uh, when it comes to negotiation, another guest that I interviewed on, on my podcast who studies negotiation, what she studies that I find fascinating is the metaphors and analogies we use to describe our negotiation influence and impact the negotiation we have. So if you see it as a battle, you approach it very differently than if you see it as a problem to be solved or if you see it as a dance that we have to do. So the metaphor that you use influences the way you interact. And you know, obviously somebody who does what I do and has the opinions that I do see negotiation much more as a collaborative effort rather than a combative effort. So how can we find circumstances that lead both of us to benefit in a way so that we can both take away something of value. Now, of course, before you go into any negotiation, you have to really understand what it is you want and prioritize the different factors involved. We don't want everything to the same level, right? We want at different levels of engagement and involvement. And so you need to prioritize, you need to understand what you want, and then come forward with that because then you can negotiate at different levels. Something that's really important to you, you'll negotiate for differently than something that's eh, a little important to you. So mm. there's, there's a process of preparation. There's a process of framing that we have to look at before we actually do any negotiation. Right. So the framing changes the whole um, uh, environment that the conversation is set in, right? Like when you look at it as a battle, it's always got to be um, just the, tying back to what we spoke at the start of this conversation. It's not listening to the other person because you're always fixated in your own thoughts. You always want to go ahead with what's there in your head. You're like, okay, this is what I want and, and this is what I'm going to speak. So uh, I often find this uh, funnily in, in uh, team conversations where, you know, when you go with uh, the outcome already in your mind, you just don't uh, give room for new details to creep in. Absolutely. You just don't. Yeah, you're just like, you know what, I've made my decision. And it makes the whole uh, uh, negotiation or even the conversation null well because you're not ready to take that new input. And often this context switching happens because you have to give room for this new information to come in. So I think with the, uh, with the guests that uh, you interviewed, she brought in a good example of reframing it. So when you reframe this to be more as a, as a game or as a dance or just like a movement, then I think you, you keep changing these blocks. You're like, okay, now there's this new information. So what do I have to look at? And then you try to rearrange these parts and get better at it. Absolutely. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And it's not just for negotiation. It's the way we frame everything. Framing determines how we approach it, how we act on it, and what we do. Mm -hmm. and that's where a lot of miscommunication can happen. You know, if I, if I see negotiation as a game and you see it as a battle, then we're coming at two different angles. And just think about conflict that you have in your own life or at work. A lot of the ways that we can help manage conflict is just to understand how people are perceiving it. So if I perceive it as something that I have to gain or we can gain together and you perceive it as something that you're losing, then we're not having the same conversation. So we have to frame and work to frame things appropriately. Right, right. And a lot of psychology involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Matt, now over to uh, a part of your creator journey. I love the fact that you host a podcast and uh, you brought in so many good examples as well as we're just starting. And uh, how exciting it is to work with these guests because, you know, I when people ask me, why do I run a podcast and, and what uh, conversations do I talk about? I know I always have this exciting story to tell them. So for you, you talk to a lot of people from different streams and from um, uh, different parts of uh, um, domains where they have their own ways that they do uh, negotiation, persuasion, or communication um, strategically. So you kind of tend to have new pieces of uh, information and facts that you learn from these conversations, right? So talk to us about your creator journey and how do you like manage all of this? Oh, I don't know that I manage it well. I think you could ask my family or not, but 
You know, I am somebody who loves learning. I, I love to learn. I'm a very curious person by nature. I love to teach. And so uh, a podcast is a, is a great opportunity to get to sit down with people who are doing really interesting stuff and ask questions. And, and I take it very seriously. I know I represent a, an audience of people who are curious like myself about the same topic I'm interested in. So I, I thoroughly enjoy it. And, and because I enjoy it, I certainly make time for it. You know, I don't think people really appreciate how much work it is to do to do podcasting or any kind of interviewing. To be good at it, you have to spend a lot of time doing doing research and work and thinking. But it's well worth it because I personally feel like I'm a much better communicator as a result of talking to the people I talk to, yeah. and I have a lot of fun. So, so when when you are learning and when you're having fun and you have a purpose, then the actual doing of the work isn't so bad. Uh, and in fact, it, it can be motivational unto itself. Yeah, it becomes a driver. Uh, totally with you on that because uh, uh, it, it kind of resonated what I usually tell people when they ask me, why do I run a podcast? Because for me, uh, very similar to your thoughts, it, it's a way to understand the, the kind of thinking the other person has, right? Like it's just it's just like a walk into their own brain. And I absolutely love that because it's like I can sit here, I can actually look at people and I can walk through their journey in, in those 30 to 50 minutes. And it's amazing. And why wouldn't you want to do that? So, yeah. And, and uh, the fun factor is um, something I think people often always fixate on and they forget that it involves a lot of hard work behind. But when the fun combines with the hard work, then there's magic. So, yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. <laughs> yes. Awesome. So, um, Matt, I would want to conclude this conversation with uh, one uh, question that I had, which uh, I think a lot of us have different styles of thinking. So sometimes it's it's easy to visualize ideas and patterns. Some people would immediately think in images and some people would often say it in words. So with visual, verbal and like different kinds of storytelling available, which style should one go with? And do you, do you usually have a research and an analysis that you've done in this in the space to talk about this? So this is not going to surprise you or your listeners. It really comes down to your audience. What's going to resonate most with your audience? So if you are speaking to a group of people who, who you think are more visual by nature, then you should present your information in, in a visual way, be it drawings, pictures, video, or, or just very descriptive language. If you're talking to people who tend to be more verbal or numeric in their approach, then give a lot of data and, and give context to that data. So, you know, all of the research that I'm aware of says, one, storytelling is important. Bullet point lists and just slide after slide are not the effective way to communicate. And anything you can do to hone your story, to be more relevant and salient yeah. for your audience is what you should do. So, you know, in many ways, it sounds like I'm just saying the same thing over and over to your questions, but you really need to know who your audience is and what resonates with them. Speaking just to speak might be enjoyable, but really speaking to move, to educate, to motivate people uh, can be very powerful. But the only way to do yeah. that is to own and tailor your message for the people you're speaking to. So there is no one right way to communicate. You have to adjust and adapt to the needs of the people you're communicating to. Right. So let's say that there are like early stage builders and founders listening to the show now. And what are the three things you want uh, them to immediately act upon? I know that there are multiple ways to start learning to effectively communicate. But if you would like them to focus on if say, three important things, what would you leave them with? Uh, first and foremost, know who, your, know who your audience is and your users are. If you're building product or services, you have to understand what's important to them. And you do that Again, uh, this was great advice from one of my guests. You do that by getting out of the building, by getting out of your chair. You don't think it through. You go talk to people and you understand yeah. what's important to them. So the second thing is listen. Know who your audience is and listen. And once you've heard that information, think through how best to package up your messages. What's the best way? Is it telling stories? Is it using data? Is it leveraging a certain structure? but figure out how to package the information up. But first, you have to know who you're talking to, you have to listen and understand them, and then you create the content. Most, I know how most people create presentations, as do you. You beg, borrow, and steal every slide you've ever created before somebody else has. You put them all together and that becomes your message. But that message is gonna fall flat. It's not gonna have a flow, it's not gonna resonate. Why? It's not targeted to the needs of the audience. 
and it's not structured in a way that can help people really understand it. So those would be the three bits of advice. And not, not only would those be, those are the three bits of advice that I teach my MBA students. I teach the people I coach. That's where you have to start. Listen, just like package. Wow. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. It was uh, a pleasure talking to you and like so many fantastic examples that you brought in. And uh, I think there's uh, a lot to learn in this space of communicating effectively, but the conversation left with uh, some good takeaway practices that most of us can just apply to our everyday lives and just take, take the lane with curiosity and, and get better at what we do. So thank you so much for sharing these tips with us, Matt. Thank you. It was a pleasure to chat with you. Awesome.